Good evening to everybody in Europe and good afternoon to all those in the Americas. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this event focusing on the difficult and challenging abuses and attacks on judicial independence and the rule of law in Colombia and Guatemala. Particularly timely to do this now. In both countries, these abuses and attacks have continued to grow and develop in ever more threatening and sinister ways. They subvert and undermine such progress as there has been towards peace, pushing impunity for serious crimes to new levels and making the work of human rights defenders ever more difficult and dangerous. And this on onslaught is coming from forces active at the highest political level in both countries. I'm going to introduce myself first and then, then the speakers. I'm John Dew, former ambassador to Colombia and Cuba, and before that, head of the Fo British Foreign Office's Latin American and Caribbean Department, where 22 years ago this month, I first made contact with AB Colombia, and I've worked closely with them in different ways ever since, and always admired their professionalism and commitment, along with their partners, CAFOD, Oxfam, Christian Aid, the Scottish Catholic International Aid Fund and Trogger, along with PBI UK, which, I, which I'm a patron, and Amnesty International. And this event has support from the European Union, as we'll hear at the end. We have some distinguished expert, expert panel speakers tonight. Hector Reyes in Colombia, Julian Salazar in Colombia, Joanna Corner, Judge of the International Criminal Court. Lisette Robledo de Howarth, the Law Society, and Louise Winstanley, Program Advocacy Manager, AB Colombia. Plan tonight that so I'd introduce each of the panel members before they speak for up to 12 minutes, leaving half an hour or more, so or, or less or more, for questions from participants some housekeeping points. We have interpretation in English and Spanish, which you can access using the buttons at the bottom of your screens. The icon is a globe. Once you click on it, you will be able to choose the language you wish to hear. Questions should be put in the chat throughout the event. Please ensure you include your name, as you may ask people, to put their questions directly to the panelists if time permits. They may also amalgamate several questions on the same subject in the interest of time. Please note we'll also be recording this event in both Spanish and English for further distribution. So let's begin with Hector Reyes, Director of the Center for Legal Action on Human Rights in Guatemala. Hector is a human rights lawyer and between 2005 and 2008, he worked on the, for the Human Rights Office of the Archbishop of Guatemala, handling cases of extrajudicial executions and investigating the genocide against the Mayan indigenous peoples during the government of Romeo Lucas Garcia. He was also part of the legal team that accompanied the first case of forced disappearance in the Chuatalun community, which achieved a landmark decision. It marked the first time in Guatemalan history that a court found a member of the military guilty of a crime against humanity, and the first time the Guatemalan court acknowledged the state's specific use of forced disappearance. Hector has worked on many high-profile trials of war crimes in Guatemala, including genocide against the Mayan peoples, during the period of Jose Efrain Rios Mont, of a massacre that took place in the village of Plan de Sanchez, where over 250 people were abused and murdered, and murdered by members of the armed forces. More recently, he's been working on issues such as criminalization of human rights defenders, cases of femicide and sexual violence against women, as well as presenting constitutional actions against initiatives such as the amnesty law, laws negatively impacting NGOs, and the extension of mining licenses 
without free, prior and informed consultation with communities. So a very highly qualified person right in the front line. So please, Hector, tell us all about it. Hector? Can I remind you again about interpretation? We have two channels. Um, the icon is on your screen, it's a globe. Press the icon and it will ask you, do you want English or Spanish? And questions should be put into the chat so that we can sort them out and respond to them at the end. Is Hector ready to speak? Muchas gracias, John, por la introducción. Agradezco mucho. Muy buenos días aún en Centroamérica. Muy buenas noches a Europa. Gracias realmente por, por estar en este conversatorio, un conversatorio sumamente importante para Guatemala. Me imagino también para Colombia, porque se va a hablar del tema de la independencia judicial, un tema que definitivamente es en estos momentos de suma álgido, un tema muy álgido en Guatemala, por lo que les voy a comentar. Pero definitivamente eh, iniciar eh, esta exposición manifestándoles que Guatemala en estos momentos vive una crisis social, una crisis política, una crisis económica eh, definitivamente muy alta. Hay un grave retroceso en materia de derechos humanos. Eh, también eh, se pensó que, por, que con la firma de los acuerdos de paz, eh, que dio fin a este conflicto de más de 36 años de un conflicto armado interno, pues las cosas iban a cambiar. Tristemente, años después, 25 años después, nos damos cuenta que esos acuerdos de paz eh, ya no están vigentes. De hecho, la gran mayoría de ellos no se cumplieron. Y uno de ellos es el que más nos ha afectado, que es eh, el Acuerdo Global sobre Derechos Humanos. Un acuerdo que se ha irrespetado, que nunca se ha logrado realizar mayores situaciones y que lo poco que se había avanzado a través de estos acuerdos eh, que se firmaron producto de la paz, pues eh, efectivamente ahora los vemos con un grave retroceso también. Ya no existe la institucionalidad de la paz en Guatemala. El actual gobierno pues la eliminó completamente y creó otra institución, pero que esta otra institución no tiene definitivamente ni el recurso ni la capacidad técnica para enfrentar los casos que, que son parte de la justicia transicional en Guatemala. En general, hay una cooptación del Estado. Los tres poderes del Estado, los organismos ejecutivo, legislativo y judicial, actúan como una comparsa, todos alineados en un frente común. Hay una alta criminalización de las líderes y lideresas que están defendiendo agua, tierra y territorio, y por eso mismo entonces hay un, eh, hay un gran eh, alta criminalización por la situación también de las empresas extractivas. Y eso hace que efectivamente en los distintos territorios donde están estas empresas extractivas, el actual gobierno lo que ha hecho es establecer estados de sitio, estados de prevención. Esto con la, el único fin de que estas em, empresas extractivas sigan laborando eh, pues a sus anchas, ¿verdad? También la cooptación del Estado es tan alta que la misma alta corte de Guatemala, que es la corte de constitucionalidad, pues efectivamente esta, este nuevo periodo es altamente con jueces eh, y, y juezas magistrados de la alta corte comprometidos eh, específicamente con el narcotráfico, con militares y también pues con la siempre oligarquía de siempre guatemalteca. Y ahora, pues el tema que nos ocupa, el tema lo que nos ocupa es esta situación que se está viviendo actualmente en el sistema de justicia de Guatemala, el ataque hacia los operadores de justicia. Acá hay operadores de justicia, efectivamente jueces y juezas independientes que en estos momentos están siendo criminalizados. Se les ha, se les a través de procedimientos aparentemente legales, se les retira su derecho de antejuicio. Es una figura que en Guatemala existe para que efectivamente eh, 
ciertos funcionarios no puedan eh, enfrentar directamente a la justicia, sino que efectivamente tiene que haber un procedimiento para que ellos, en caso dado, hayan cometido un delito penal, pues sean perseguidos. En este caso, hay jueces y juezas independientes que en estos momentos pues se les están retirando o ya se les retiró su derecho de antejuicio. Y eso para nosotros sí es preocupante. Hoy eh, invité personalmente a uno de los jueces independientes que está pasando este proceso de criminalización, que no sabemos si ya en este momento puede estar siendo capturado en su, incluso en su propia judicatura. Y me estoy refiriendo a uno de los jueces de mayor riesgo que efectivamente ha conocido casos eh, como el de genocidio, contra el grupo N. Comayeshil, otro caso, Molina Teisen, eh, otros casos del presente, que efectivamente a, a través de su judicatura ha emitido sentencias condenatorias. Pero también hay otros jueces independientes, como la doctora Yamil Barrios, como la doctora Erika Ifán, que en estos momentos pues efectivamente están eh, pasando por esta situación que se les está retirando su derecho de antejuicio con una serie de denuncias espurias, denuncias que a, todo, que a todas luces son ilegales. Sin embargo, les dan trámite. La misma Corte Suprema de Justicia avala efectivamente esta situación. Y ahora también otro elemento que tenemos que unir a esta criminalización contra los jueces y juezas independientes, pues tenemos que platicarles también sobre lo que están viviendo efectivamente funcionarios, fiscales, eh, auxiliares fiscales de la CICIC, de la ex CICIC, que ahora están siendo criminalizados también por la labor que en un momento realizaron a través de esos casos de alto impacto que fueron develados. Sin embargo, ahora se descriminaliza y eh, actualmente pues eh, la Fiscalía contra la Impunidad que quedó en lugar de la ex CICIC, que fue parte de ese acompañamiento de la CICIC, pues efectivamente la gran mayoría están siendo criminalizados. Ejemplo de ello, pues es que en Guatemala ya no, es, ya no se encuentra Juan Francisco Sandoval, quien específicamente era el jefe de la Fiscalía de la FESI. Pero también ahora se unen a él otros compañeros y compañeras eh, de la FESI, quienes ahorita en este momento están enfrentando procesos penales producto de lo que ellos en un momento develaron en en los casos del presente. Y ahí pues hay funcionarios, exfuncionarios, incluso o el, el expresidente y la ex vicepresidenta Otto Pérez Molina y Rosana Valdete que están enfrentando en estos momentos en Guatemala a través de un tribunal de sentencia por, por uno de los casos que la sí, ex CICIC pues develó como es el caso La Línea. Y esto ahorita en este momento entonces lo que vemos es que no existen esos auxiliares y esos fiscales quienes investigaron estos casos, entonces nos preguntamos cómo va a ser el resultado si los fiscales que en ese momento hicieron esta investigación, efectivamente ya ellos no están al frente, ya no están, como ya no son parte del ente acusador de Guatemala. Por eso, por eso mismo, definitivamente también se des desestructuró a través de la Fiscal de Derechos Humanos. La Fiscalía de Derechos Humanos en Guatemala ha hecho un trabajo sumamente importante en todos los casos de justicia en transición, escuchando a las víctimas. Sin embargo, también eh, la Fiscal General y Jefa del Ministerio Público también destituyó a la licenciada Hilda Pineda como Fiscal de Derechos Humanos y la trasladó a otra fiscalía. Esto realmente para nosotros es muy preocupante cómo ahorita en este momento el sistema de justicia, esa independencia judicial está siendo trastocada específicamente por cierto grupo que han logrado esa cooptación general del Estado guatemalteco. Y esos grupos me refiero al crimen organizado, al narcotráfico, a militares, que de una u otra manera pues efectivamente han hecho una cooptación del Estado. Ahorita en Guatemala también se está viviendo lo que es el cambio aparentemente de la, de la Fiscalía, del Ministerio Público. Está un, todo un proceso específicamente para la designación del nuevo o de la nueva fiscal. Sin embargo, como organizaciones sociales vemos que ese, procede, que ese proceso de designación está viciado. Por ende, entonces definitivamente estamos observando, auditando ese proceso, sin embargo, la gran mayoría de las hojas de vida que llegaron y que son parte de este proceso de la nueva elección, 
son hojas de vida comprometidas con ciertos sectores del país. Por lo cual entonces no vemos que exista en este momento o que vaya a haber un relevo que ayude definitivamente a cambiar al, la, la metodología, la forma de trabajar, donde el Ministerio Público en este momento está criminalizando a sus propios trabajadores, está criminalizando a los activistas de derechos humanos y está también criminalizando incluso a periodistas o a todas aquellas personas que están en oposición al actual gobierno. Y aunado a esto, pues efectivamente también hay una ley de ONGs que está vigente, la cual pues nos quiere acallar a las organizaciones sociales como CalDH para que efectivamente no nos pronunciemos. Nuestro derecho de asociación, nuestro derecho de movilización está siendo conculcado a través de esta ley de ONGs abiertamente ilegal y que efectivamente en este momento pues están esos procesos, esperamos que esos procesos sean un poco más democráticos para no llegar a lo que la, las organizaciones hermanas nicaragüenses están sufriendo, es decir, con la cancelación de las mismas. Por todo lo anterior, no que más me resta es decirles a ustedes que por favor mantengan la observación sobre lo que está pasando en Guatemala que también hagan un pronunciamiento fuerte respecto a lo que está sucediendo en Guatemala y de ser posible puedan realizar una misión de verificación para que se den cuenta de que todo lo que hoy he denunciado es algo que está sucediendo y se está realizando y materializando en Guatemala. Como les decía, hoy hubiese querido que me acompañara en esta exposición también el, el juez, uno de los jueces criminalizados, eh, Pablo Chitumón, sin embargo, por situaciones propias y por su, su, su seguridad, no nos pudo acompañar en este, en este evento. Pero efectivamente, él es parte de este grupo de, de jueces y juezas independientes que están siendo criminalizados. Así que, de mi parte, muchísimas gracias por su atención. Thank you very much, Hector. That, I knew the situation was difficult. I hadn't realized how difficult, how alarming, and how dangerous things are. I think what you've told us makes us think very hard, makes us salute the courage of you and all your colleagues defending human rights and trying to work for a, a better outcome. And we'll certainly think very hard about it indeed. Thank you very much. I'd like to pass on now to Julian Salazar from Colombia. Julian is the Center for Investigation and Popular Education Program for Peace, CINA, in Colombia. Julian studied law, human rights, democratization in the Colombian universities of Rosario and Externado and in Carlos Tercero in Madrid. He has extensive experience working in international cooperation and non-governmental organizations. He's been engaged in formulating and implementing projects to improve access to justice based on restorative strategies and community justice. His focus has been on conflict resolution and protection of vulnerable individuals or groups due to gender, race, socioeconomic or geographic reasons. Recently, he's been providing legal support to ethnic communities located in the Bajo Atrato region of Chocó, Colombia, supporting them to access the current transitional justice mechanisms through litigation with the objective of guaranteeing maximum access to truth, justice, and reparation of the victims. So Julian, Tell us about the situation in Colombia. Bueno, eh, un saludo a todos y a todas eh, las asistentes a este evento. Yo quisiera concentrar mi intervención quizás en dos puntos. Quisiera destacar primero eh, la importancia que tiene la independencia judicial en contextos de transición. Y segundo, eh, quisiera hablar un poco sobre sobre las injerencias y, y sobre los ataques que ha tenido la independencia judicial eh, de la Jurisdicción Especial para la Paz. Ustedes saben que la Jurisdicción Especial para la Paz es uno de los órganos 
eh, que fue creado en virtud del acuerdo de paz suscrito entre, entre las FARC y el Estado colombiano, y es principalmente pues, eh, el tribunal de cierre eh, de los hechos que han sucedido dentro, de, dentro del marco del conflicto armado. Entonces voy, voy a comenzar con el primer punto y quizás mm, voy a comenzar con eh, diciendo que la, que la independencia judicial eh, juega un papel muy importante en, en contextos de transición, especialmente eh, porque la independencia judicial eh, permite eh, que los estados puedan cumplir con, el, con, con su deber de investigar, juzgar y sancionar las graves violaciones a los derechos humanos y eh, especialmente eh, esto permite el cumplimiento de las garantías a las, de, de las víctimas a la verdad, justicia y reparación. Allí, allí podemos ver que en, pues, que en una serie de experiencias comparadas en escenarios de transición, especialmente en, en, en América Latina, el constituir eh, un poder judicial con una independencia judicial robusta realmente ha permitido que estas sociedades puedan hacer una transición hacia la, hacia la, democracia, hacia la democracia y ahí hacia la paz. De tal forma que allí pues, uno, uno, uno podría decir que hay un círculo virtuoso entre la independencia judicial, el deber del Estado a investigar, juzgar y sancionar las violaciones a los derechos humanos y las garantías de las víctimas a la verdad, justicia y reparación. Es decir, que eh, un Estado eh, que garantiza la independencia judicial, tanto como un, un derecho fundamental de los operadores judiciales como de los, de los, de los ciudadanos, es un Estado que puede, puede apuntar eh, a, a, la, a la investigación de graves violaciones a los derechos humanos. También hay otras experiencias comparadas donde señalan que, pues, efectivamente, por ejemplo, en contextos eh, de fuertes dictaduras y donde los eh, operadores judiciales han, eh, han, han visto minada su independencia judicial, eh, lo que se observa allí es una falta de judicialización frente a estas graves violaciones a los derechos humanos y lo que evidencia esto efectivamente son unos bajos niveles de eficiencia y de efectividad de la justicia, lo que termina en últimas redundando en unos altos índices de impunidad. Entonces, eh, la independencia judicial es un, es un, es un valor axiológico eh, de, las, de, de las democracias de, de tal forma que si se envista a los operadores judiciales eh, con, 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 con este derecho y con este valor fundamental pues muy seguramente eh, se pueda lograr quizás una, una, una transición eh, mucho más fácil hacia la paz y hacia la construcción de un, de, del, del Estado de Derecho y del fortalecimiento de las instituciones democráticas porque eh, en ese sentido, eh, ya aterrizando quizás la importancia de la independencia judicial en Colombia y especialmente la Jurisdicción Especial para la Paz, eh, desde que la Jurisdicción Especial para la Paz en el, eh, empezó a funcionar, este sistema de justicia eh, ha sufrido diferentes ataques y ha sufrido diferentes injerencias eh, por parte de agentes del Estado y por parte de actores políticos que han pretendido minar su independencia judicial. Y allí es muy importante eh, traer a colación eh, esta, este concepto eh, de, la insular, de la insularidad política. La insularidad política, pues, básicamente nos, nos refiere a la, a la necesidad de que sea una judicatura independiente de las instituciones políticas y del público en general, de, de tal forma que eh, el juez sea un, 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 un interlocutor entre, las, entre los diferentes argumentos de las partes, eh, pero que se vea libre a la hora de fallar de cualquier eh, influencia política. Y es allí donde efectivamente la Jurisdicción Especial de Paz pues, ha, ha tenido eh, diferentes injerencias y que han minado su independencia judicial. Yo quisiera hacerles como un pequeño recuento de diferentes acciones eh, que han pretendido eh, vulnerar y cercenar la independencia judicial de la Jurisdicción Especial de Paz. Allí encontramos en primera medida eh, cuando eh, en, en el trámite o aprobación de la Jurisdicción Especial de Paz eh, pasó por la Corte Constitucional. Allí la Corte Constitucional excluyó eh, de la, jef, la competencia personal de, de, de terceros civiles eh, 
especialmente de terceros civiles que han participado en el financiamiento directa e indirectamente del conflicto armado. Entonces allí los, los terceros civiles tienen, eh, no tienen una comparecencia obligatoria, sino que lo hacen de, de forma voluntaria. Y, y, y lo que hizo el Tribunal Constitucional de Colombia fue principalmente eh, arguir que el juez natural de, de, de estas personas, de los terceros civiles, es la jurisdicción ordinaria y no una jurisdicción transicional como es la jurisdicción especial de paz. Y lo que, y lo que queda ahí es que efectivamente pues hay, hay un vector de impunidad muy grande respecto del rol que jugaron estos terceros civiles como actores económicos eh, y como actores que financiaron el conflicto armado, que es una, que es una verdad eh, que todavía está en mora de ser develada por parte de estos actores y efectivamente que, pues, puedan, que, que ellos tengan una comparecencia pues, voluntaria eh, continúa reproduciendo mmm, esta impunidad respecto de la verdad que estos actores tienen eh, que contar sobre el conflicto armado. Allí también eh, se observan eh, diferentes acciones que han, que han, que han buscado minar la independencia, especialmente eh, se han presentado en el, en el Congreso de Colombia diferentes proyectos de ley por parte del partido de gobierno, especialmente por el Centro Democrático, quienes han pretendido eliminar o abolir la jurisdicción especial de paz, han buscado as eh, asfixiarla financieramente, especialmente con el recorte eh, de recursos eh, para, para el desarrollo de la misionalidad eh, que tiene la jurisdicción especial de paz. Y allí también hay un aspecto muy importante y es... Eh, que el, el partido de gobierno del Centro Democrático ha pretendido también a través eh, de, de diferentes proyectos de ley cambiar la estructura y cambiar la arquitectura de la jurisdicción especial de paz, especialmente buscando la creación de, de salas paralelas para el, para el juzgamiento de los militares que sean sometidos a la JEP. Eh, esto con, pues, apelando a unos argumentos maniqueos, especialmente eh, del... Del, del, del honor militar y, y argumentando o apelando a que los militares pues tienen que ser juzgados también eh, por personas que tengan conocimiento eh, de los eh, de las de, de la de la normativ de la normatividad militar eh, allí también hay se han observado series de estigmatizaciones cuando la JEP eh, fue creada frente a los magistrados, eh, inclusive en muchas ocasiones los, los tildaban como subversivos eh, y, y también se, señalaban a la jurisdicción especial pues, como un tribunal que favorecería la impunidad eh, frente al juzgamiento de estos crímenes, atacando directamente pues, a, los, a los magistrados y a, la, y a la misionalidad de la jurisdicción especial de paz. Mm. Allí, allí, allí también hay, un, hay que observar un hecho mmm, bastante relevante y son las objeciones que presentó el presidente Iván Duque eh, frente a la ley de procedimiento de la jurisdicción especial de paz. Allí el presidente Iván Duque prese, eh, presentó una serie de objeciones frente a esta ley, objeciones que no tenían ningún tipo de asidero jurídico, especialmente porque estas objeciones ya habían tramitadas por la Corte Constitucional y no, y, no, y no tenían ningún tipo eh, de fundamento jurídico. Por otro lado, también hay que decir eh, que la jurisdicción eh, mm, eh, ha tenido eh, o se ha visto minada especialmente por, eh, por los comparecientes y por los firmantes de paz. Es decir, eh, los mismos firmantes y que eh, acordaron crear la jurisdicción de paz eh, hay, hay varios de ellos eh, que desistieron del acuerdo y que conformaron las disidencias, eh, pues que en este momento, eh, por ejemplo, se encuentra el Paisa, Fidal Márquez, que son los que, los que decidieron eh, eh, conformar unas disidencias y ellos pues efectivamente eh, no hacen, fueron excluidos de la jurisdicción especial de paz y evidentemente esto pues, eh, pues también ataca eh, o genera más bien una deslegitimidad en la, en, la, en la jurisdicción especial de paz, ya que ellos pues efectivamente estaban llamados a rendir una versión voluntaria en el marco de los casos que fueron constituidos por este tribunal, 
pero pues ellos por su falta de, pues por su reingreso a la, a, a, a la guerra, eh, ya ellos fueron excluidos por la Jurisdicción Especial de Paz. Y allí hay un caso que quisiera traer a colación, que es un caso reciente, y es el caso de Benito Osorio. Benito Osorio es un funcionario, es un, es un civil, es un tercero civil, eh, que él, él está compareciendo a la Jurisdicción Especial de Paz y él está pues, con, con un compromiso eh, de establecer la verdad eh, develando el fenómeno paramilitar, sus nexos y las interacciones que ha tenido este fenómeno con actores políticos y económicos del país. Es un caso muy emblemático sobre, sobre despojo que ocurre en el, en el Urabá. Es un caso muy emblemático donde muchos campesinos fueron despojados y fueron desplazados eh, de, de sus tierras eh, por, eh, por el Fondo Ganadero de Córdoba. Con permiso, eh, Julián. Con permiso. Sus 12 minutos casi acabados. Ya, ya, voy, a, ya, 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 ya voy a terminar. Eh, y finalmente, pues, allí hay, allí, allí hay un proceso electoral. Actualmente, pues, Colombia está en un proceso electoral donde muchas de las campañas de, de los políticos tienen como bandera eliminar la Jurisdicción Especial de Paz, pero también hay que decir que la Jurisdicción Especial de Paz eh, actualmente se encuentra abriendo nuevos casos, especialmente eh, tres casos sobre crímenes de las FARC, crímenes de fuerza pública y crímenes que se han cometido frente a las comunidades étnicas. Entonces, finalmente, para cerrar, yo creo que la, 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 la JEP no tiene la legitimidad eh, todavía suficiente per se, pero definitivamente eh, la JEP tiene que ir construyendo su legitimidad y esta legitimidad se va, se, se va a ir construyendo a, a medida que pueda tener asegurada su, su independencia y a medida que va cumpliendo con sus normas de procedimiento claras que garanticen juicios imparciales a, las, a, las, a los victimarios, que garanticen los derechos a la verdad, justicia y reparación de las víctimas. Y, y, lo, que, y lo que quiero hacer aquí es un llamado a la, a la comunidad internacional a cobijar a la JEP, a blindar su independencia judicial, especialmente en el caso, por ejemplo, de Benito Osorio, yo creo que es fundamental eh, que se pueda conformar una comisión de monitoreo para, para observar eh, las debidas formas procesales y debido proceso de, de, de este juicio, además que es fundamental la protección eh, y la seguridad tanto de los comparecientes, eh, de los fiscales de la JEP y de los magistrados que hace parte de la jurisdicción especial de paz. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Julian. It was a very important, important to have such a, a clear, a clear picture from the front line of the challenges and the difficulties that you and others face in Colombia, and certainly the the message is that you international community needs needs to maintain and extend its support because clearly there are forces in Colombia that um, are pushing the other way. So thank you very much. Can I, before I go on to the next speaker, I just say there are no or very few questions that have been asked. So I would encourage all those participating, do put your questions in the chat. Don't wait to the very end. The sooner you get them in, the better they can be processed. I'll move on to our next speaker, Joanna Corner, CMG QC, Judge of the International Criminal Court. It's a great privilege to have her with us today. Joanna was called to the bar at the Inner Temple in 1974. She'd been a practicing barrister undertaking criminal work, both for prosecution and defense. She was made a Queen's Counsel in 1993 and undertook serious criminal cases, including fraud, murder, serious sexual offences, other grave crimes. In 1999, she became a senior prosecuting trial attorney at the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. She also worked closely with the judiciary of Bosnia and Herzegovina between 2004 and 2005. She was a senior advisor, senior legal advisor to the chief prosecutor during the establishment of the war crimes section. She's written numerous reports supported by the organization 
for Security and Cooperation in Europe on the state of war crimes processing in Bosnia and Herzegovina. In March 2021, Joanna was officially sworn in as a judge of the International Criminal Court. So it's a great, great privilege to have her here with us today, Joanna. Um, thank you very much, John. I, I actually think the privilege is mine, um, uh, having listened to, to the previous speakers um, and my admiration uh, for those um, in Colombia and Guatemala who are doing this work um, is, is unbounded. And, and I feel something of a fraud being here, um, although I do have some credentials for speaking because uh, between 2015 and 2019, um, I devised and delivered together with um, other people um, a, a training programs for judges uh, of Colombia, Peru, Panama, Guatemala, El Salvador, uh, Nicaragua, Honduras, uh, and uh, Costa Rica. Uh, and the venues for these programs were in um, Panama, Peru, uh, and Colombia, and Guatemala in Antigua. I, I feel, however, that, that um, these training programs were not designed um, for the sort of situation that has been described by the previous um, speakers. Uh, the main topic throughout has been how to manage long and complex trials. Um, that included also, obviously, ethics, uh, judicial training, judicial appointments, uh, and the like. Um, and like all training programs, um, learning is always a two-way process. And so the discussions that we had with participants outside the regime of lectures and, and, and problems to solve, um, gave me at least a basic understanding of what the problems um, were, uh, and really huge problems, obviously, which face judges uh, in all of these countries, but obviously today, particularly in Colombia and Guatemala. Um, and those problems are how to manage the trials, which eventually are meant to deliver uh, justice uh, to victims, and not just victims of crime, um, but those who are involved in commercial disputes um, and the like, or unable to recover uh, money. Uh, one of the huge problems it seemed to me at that stage, and, and that was before I heard about the attacks on judges, um, and those uh, officials of the lower courts in, in Guatemala, the acute problem seemed to be, um, firstly, the number of accused that it is attempted to try together. Uh, and secondly, partly because of that and partly for other reasons, uh, the length of time it took uh, to conduct these trials and for any conclusion to have been reached. And all these problems, of course, have been magnified, as everywhere, by the pandemic. In every country, the courts effectively stopped sitting to a large extent uh, during the, those early months, certainly, of 2020. And the backlog of cases is absolutely massive and really eye-wateringly so. And so... If case management of long and complex trials, corruption, drug smuggling, um, uh, and all of that was, is of, was of importance then, it is doubly so now. The problem, of course, is how does one get a justice system in the light of the attacks that are being carried on on the judiciary and others into working order? I think before briefly turning to the essentials of um, uh, managing these trials, as I hope a guide to, to future times. Um, can I make a few observations uh, from my reading, um, obviously magnified by the speakers today, 
um, uh, in Colombia and Guatemala. And in particular, the problems which were set out by the Human Rights Watch report uh, uh, in December 2020. Of course, Colombia is of particular interest at the moment to the International Criminal Court because the Office of the Prosecutor, having opened a preliminary investigation in, two, in June 2004 into the situation, um, and in 2012, having determined uh, that war crimes had been committed, uh, on the 28th of October um, of uh, uh, last year, uh, the new prosecutor um, concluded a cooperation agreement with the government of Colombia, uh, in which he stated that the progress which had been made um, has led his office to determine that the national authorities of Colombia are neither inactive, unwilling or unable genuinely to investigate and prosecute the Rome Statute crimes. Um, well, obviously, he hadn't heard what the speaker today had to say. And so the preliminary examination um, has been closed. It's not for me to comment on whether that was the right decision. Certainly, Human Rights Watch um, says um, that it wasn't. Um, it, they felt it was premature and counterproductive uh, to the goal of affording access to justice for victims um, to uh, close the um, investigation. Um, but um, that is uh, what has happened. Other events, obviously, um, have been the uh, arrest of the former president um, of, of Colombia and the reaction from the president uh, Duque, um, uh, which rather tended to smear the court according to human rights um, watch. The agreement between Colombia and the Office of the Prosecutor in Article 1 um, requires the Colombian government without prejudice to the separation of powers, and that's obviously something which should be underlined, to allow the special jurisdiction for peace, the ordinary courts, and an earlier transitional justice process to proceed, and I quote, without interference and to provide adequate financial resources to the courts and security for all participants uh, in these processes. Guatemala, the 2020 report, uh, recorded the delays in the appointment of judges and high court justices, allegations of corruption, uh, the flouting of the constitutional court rulings uh, to ensure that suitable candidates are appointed, uh, and the delays uh, which um, uh, occur because courts fail to represent, sorry, to, re to respect legally mandated timeframes uh, and take months to reschedule uh, hearings. And as already been pointed out by um, Hector Reyes, criminal proceedings against powerful actors often suffer, uh, suffer unreasonably long delays due to the extensive use of motions by criminal defendants and intimidation of judges, prosecutors, and the like. So, um, in the light of all of this, as I say, I I'm not sure how much use my suggestions of, of, of case management are going to be, but I hope that in future, uh, regimes will be established which do allow um, proper uh, case managed trials to take place. It means case management working with people to obviously to secure the best result. And the best result is that which preserves the justice of the process and as well as the general administration of justice. And as far as judges are concerned, and not just judges, it involves leadership and the making of decisions. A judge has to be able to decide fairly uh, what will be allowed if there's no agreement. And above all, the judges, uh, and it may be pie in the sky at the moment, 
although from what Mr. Ray says about the judge that he hoped would appear, the courage to make difficult uh, and possibly publicly unpopular decisions, uh, to resist threats, uh, whether from parties to the actions or the executive. And above all, it, apply, it, it requires a strong ethical code. An active management means identifying at an early stage the real issues in the case. What are the needs of the witnesses, particularly those who are victim witnesses? Setting timetables for the progress of the case, monitoring the progress of the case, and making sure that directions made by the judge or judges are complied with. Uh, ensuring that evidence which is presented is done so in the shortest and clearest way uh, and discouraging delay. Uh, and above all in these times, and that is the one thing that one can say that the pandemic did produce that was good, making much more use of technology, uh, video hearings, remote hearings, protection for witnesses and the like. These have all advanced dramatically over the last uh, couple of years. And as for the role of the judge, well, that goes without saying, it requires leadership, authority, control, decisiveness, but above all, and I think that can be said for a judge in any jurisdiction, courage, and I commend uh, those judges in Guatemala and Colombia who are showing the courage uh, to uh, carry on trying to deliver uh, justice. Thank you very much, Judge Corner. I think it was extremely salutary for us to hear a voice from the other side, the Inter International Criminal Court. And I think that the voice of reason contrasting with what we've heard, the actual situation on the ground in these countries, I think was a, an, an important contribution, so thank you. We pass thank on you. to Lisette Robledo de Howarth of the Law Society of England and Wales. Lisette works for the Law Society managing the international public interest work, and international rule of law programs. She's worked for over 16 years in international development, focusing on international public policy, research and advocacy. The work has been published by the Birkbeck Law Review and the United Nations Association, among others. More recently, she researched and wrote the Law Society's global report, advocating for change, transforming the future of the legal profession through greater gender equality, and co-authored the joint Law Society, Bates Wells Global Report, Practical Toolkit, for women in law. She also researched and co-authored in 2020 the report, A Window of Opportunity, Support to the Rule of Law in Guatemala. She is currently conducting research on gender equality and the status of women in the legal profession in several jurisdictions, including Guatemala, Mexico, Spain, and China. She is a member of the Inner Temple, Fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, Fellow of the Chartered Management Institute, and an Associate Fellow of the Higher Education Academy. So, Lisette, over to you. Thank you, John. Firstly, I would like, I feel very privileged to be sharing this platform with my fellow panelists. And I thank to I, ABC Columbia for the opportunity to present the report, A Window of Opportunity for the Rule of Law in Guatemala. As Hector Reyes alluded to during his intervention, uh, although Guatemala has been in relative peace for 25 years, the centuries of inequality and decades of conflict that preceded the 1996 peace accords have left a legacy of impunity, corruption, racism and violence. Factors that continue to, to be present and fun are, represent a fundamental threat to stability and equitable development today. The broader commitment to social justice and the rule of law made in the peace agreement also remain largely unfulfilled. However, in recent years, 
the commitment of those justice sector operators working with integrity, independence and commitment to the rule of law, supported by the now former UN-backed International Commission Against Impunity, or CSIG, achieved some impressive milestones in promoting accountability and transparency. In that regard, with the CSIG, the justice sector received the boost and security needed to undertake their work. In 2015, just four years before the closing of the CSIG, the Guatemalan Spring united people in protest as they demanded more concerted efforts and reforms to fight corruption and end impunity. This led to the resignation and arrest of Guatemala's then president and vice president after they were implicated in an unprecedented case of corruption. That same year, Jimmy Morales, a TV comedian, was elected president based upon his anti-corruption platform and a promise to extend C6 mandate. During this period, CSIC's work also intensified and many believed that CSIC, with robust backing from the international community, was supporting Guatemala's efforts to consolidate the rule of law. But when CSIC opened an investigation into President Morales himself and his family's involvement in illegal campaign financing, he began attacking CSIC's legitimacy and credibility. The Trump administration also changed its foreign policy and interest and show indifferent towards uh, CSIC, which reversed the US previous position as CSIC's greatest supporter. So it is unsurprised, unsurprising that on the 3rd of September 2019, when its mandate expired, CSIC closed its doors. It is in this context that in December 2019, a delegation from the International Legal Assistance Consortium, ILAC, and its member organizations, which included the Cyrus Van Center and the Law Society, traveled to Guatemala to assess the state of Guatemala's justice sector after the closure of the CSIG. The Window of Opportunity Report is the result of that visit. It is worth noting that ILAC released a previous research in 2018, which the Law Society was also part of, which al al allowed us to compare and contrast the situation in the country. From the 2020 research, it was evident that the systematic attacks on the rule of law in Guatemala had intensified and the decision not to renew C6 mandate was one of the major casualties of this assault. This damaged the progress made in strengthening the rule of law, especially in terms of continuing empowering the justice sector to operate with integrity and independence. Given time constraints, I will only focus on three key findings. I will also be putting the links to the reports on the chat. So the three areas that I will be talking uh, about is the law, fair and the security of judges, judicial independence and separation of powers and judicial nominations. With regards to law, fair and the security of judges, we found that recent threats against the justice sector, especially with regards to the security of judges, have reversed much of the progress that was made to strengthen the rule of law during c existence. Guatemalan stakeholders highlighted that justice sector institutions and actors have all suffered at the hands of a common strategy, the use of the law to attack the justice system and undermine the rule of law. Hector al already alluded to law fighting in his presentation, and this abuse of the law combined with threats made against the personal safety of those judges and lawyers who are working with integrity and independence has left the justice sector institution in a vulnerable state. We also found that the number of attacks against human rights defenders had been on the rise, with most attacks occurring in rural areas against indigenous leaders who were working to protect their land, prevent fund further environmental degradation, and for the right to be consulted. It is also worrying that in this context, the Guatemalan Bar Association has remained silent in response to the threats being made against Guatemala's justice institutions, just judges and lawyers. The Guatemalan Bar Association, for example, never responded to our request to meet. With 
regards to judicial independence and separation of powers, we found that Guatemala is failing to comply with international and regional guarantees to ensure an independent and impartial judiciary. The Inter-American Commission, for example, has insisted that the independence of the judiciary and its clear separation from the other branches of government must be respected and ensured both by the executive and the legislature, including preventing interference by other branches of government. It is significant to note that the principle of judicial independence is firmly embedded in the Guatemalan constitutions. In fact, articles 154 and 203, for example, set out the independence of the judicial branch from the executive and legislative branches and define political and legal sanctions for interference with the courts. Articles 12 and 207 of the constitutions also addresses judicial independence as a guarantee for individuals' rights to due process, stating that only a competent judge in application of the legally established procedure can limit an individual's fundamental right. And finally, Article 205 of the Guatemalan Constitution breaks down judicial independence into four components, functional independence, economic independence, irremovability of judges, except in cases and procedures of destitution expre expressly conveyed by the law, and last, exclusive right to select staff. In this regard, functional independence is the guarantee that judges' decisions are only subject to the rule of law and not any other influence, with reference primarily to the executive and legislative branches. With regards to judicial no nominations, we also uh, uh, um, are perceiving a serious threat. In the 2018 report, uh, our experts frequently heard that nomination committee members were often perceived as acting as representatives of group interests or engaging in generalized clientelism rather than being objective evaluators. Similar to those findings, we found that Guatemalan stakeholders see the judicial nomination process as a tool to control the judiciary and fill its benches with judges willing to preserve the impunity of the political and economic elite. The involvement of the executive and legislative in the selection and appointments of justice operations, operators endangers independence of members of the judiciary. To conclude, what the experience with the CSIG has shown us is that a balance needs to be struck where Guatemala has autonomy over its own institutions and policy, but with a strong commitment without hidden agendas and close support from the international community, whether it is through providing direct technical assistance to build capacity or political support to empower those operating with integrity and against impunity. Time and real long-term commitment will help rebuild the trust of the Guatemalan people in the international community. The use of lawfare tactics, the disregard for the separation of powers and the lack of transparency and potential politicization of the judicial nomination process are all contributory factors that threaten the independence, integrity and impartiality of justice sector institutions and their actors. These factors can have a deep and long-lasting consequence on Guatemalan society, inhibiting a very active and robust civil society and can prevent rebuilding trust in public institutions. It is paramount that we help Guatemala to preserve judicial independence for the future of the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz Lizette, Thank for your clarity and your ability to put things in context has been really valuable, so thank you very much. Um, can move on to our next speaker, Louise Wynne-Stanley, Programme and Advocacy Manager for AB Colombia. Louise has been in this role since 2010. Before that, she was the Advocacy Officer for Peace Brigades International, and also spent two years in Colombia working as an international observer with the Peace Brigades. 
She has an MSc in Globalization, Latin American Development. She's the author of many of AB Columbia's reports and has contributed to a book on unarmed resistance and global solidarity. Louise has worked on the issues of human rights and sustainable development in Colombia since 2003. So she has a huge amount of experience and knowledge to share with us, Louise. Thank you very much. Um, well, you, you've heard directly from uh, Julianne regarding the situation that's confronting independence of the judiciary in Colombia. And I'm just going to mention some aspects of the current context in Colombia and to highlight some actions that can be taken by lawyers and the international community in order to help promote tackling impunity, corruption and independence of the judiciary in Colombia. Since time is very short, I'm going to just highlight a few points and then outline some key recommendations. The first point I'd like to make is that despite, in spite of a peace process with the FARC, conflict continues in Colombia with the ELN guerrilla group, dissidents of the FARC and right-wing paramilitary groups. The situation of communities, especially outside of the cities, has deteriorated dramatically recently as illegal armed groups exercise territorial control with selective murders, forced confinement, internal displacement, placing of landmines, gender-based violence, and forced recruitment of minors. Courageously, the Bishop of Kibdo just recently mentioned, spoke out about the situation in the Department of Choco and the humanitarian crisis that this is creating. And at the same time, he highlighted the collusion that exists between the state security forces and illegal armed groups. Unfortunately, uh, Bishop Barreto has been asked publicly by the Colombian Interior Minister to withdraw these statements, which is not only concerning for democracy, but also has generated risks for Bishop Barreto. Secondly, social leaders, lawyers, human rights defenders are being targeted and killed in ever greater numbers in Colombia. According to the NGO in De Paz, 24 human rights defenders were killed in the first 43 days of this year. And that means that on average, one human rights defender was killed every other day. A further point I'd like to make is that many international studies have shown that women play a key role in the sustainability of peace processes. And in Colombia, we have not only seen femicide, domestic violence and conflict re related sexual violence against women increasing since the signing of the peace accord, but also extremely high levels of impunity for this crime. Increased violence and the attitudes that drive this violence reduces women's capacities to engage in the peace in peace building and effectively participate in decision making bodies. And one final point that I want to make is that the problem in Colombia is not only conflict, but also deeply rooted links between paramilitary groups and some politicians. Collusion in some parts of the country between paramilitary groups and security forces. And as Julian mentioned, the case of Benito Osorio is particularly important because it shows the links between paramilitary groups, politics, economic actors, and the security forces. The network of violence in Colombia is driven by political and criminal objectives, fueled by illicit economies and the struggle for con the control of these by different illegal armed groups. The high level of impunity in Colombia does little to prevent or dissuade the growth of violence and corruption. It is vital to address the dismantling of these illegal networks and to identify and prosecute not only the perpetrators, but also the intellectual authors behind the crimes. The peace accord has created an important, important mechanisms in this respect which have the possibility of tackling impunity and the potential to reveal not just the perpetrators of the violence, but also the authors of these crimes. The transitional justice process is one of these key instruments. 
Therefore, international monitoring and reaction to any political pressure and violence or attacks against the Special Jurisdiction for Peace and the Truth Commission are essential. One recommendation that I would make is that lawyers and the associations they belong to in Europe systematically monitor the work of the Special Jurisdiction for Peace, undertake trial observations, and remain, remain alert to the threats against judges, victims, and, and, and against NGOs supporting those victims through the transitional justice process. And that they make public, strong public statements about any attacks and threats against them. The Truth Commission's report is due to be published in June of this year. And it is essential that the information in this report is acted upon. We would therefore urge lawyers association to engage with this report and ensure that the information is not just left on the shelf. Another key mechanism created by the Peace Accord is the National Commission of Security Guarantees and its job is to develop comprehensive policies for the dismantling of paramilitary and other criminal groups. In order to dismantle these groups, it recognized that they would have to identify the authors of the crimes and not just the perpetrators. One of the positive features of the National Commission of Security Guarantees is that it has NGO representatives on, on it, alongside government agencies. AB Columbia has been calling for the UN Security Council to provide a group of experts on organized crime and security to assist the National Commission of Security Guarantees in the development of these policies. It is also essential to ensure that this commission continues to function and that the expert advice and support is provided not only to the commission as a whole, but also especially to NGO representatives. And this again is maybe where lawyers organizations and associations can help with experts in a, uh, that could give advice on organized crime and security to NGO representatives working with the government to develop these policies. Finally, it is vital that the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women is invited to undertake an official visit to Colombia to examine the situation of violence against women and to make recommendations. It is vital to ensure the full engagement women in the peace process and to tackle the violence along with the attitudes that drives that violence and, and which hinders their participation. The international community should therefore do all that it can to support such a visit. These are a few actions that you and other org international organizations can take to support and tackle impunity in Colombia and support independence of the judicial system. Before finishing, I would like to highlight a couple of points that Hector uh, made in his talk. It's really important that strong statements are made by international lawyers organizations about the situation in Guatemala right now. And also, um, Umbia has been very fortunate in that the Colombian caravana of lawyers has been organizing every other year a visit to Colombia in order to monitor the situation uh, in relation to judges uh, uh, and the judicial system and to support those working uh, to uphold human rights. And this is something that I would ask that uh, lawyers or associations consider doing for, for Guatemala at this moment in time, because Guatemala is at a very crucial stage uh, and I think both Lisette and Hector have highlighted the dangers that it's facing. So I'm hoping that lawyers organizations out there will also consider doing something similar to the Colombian caravan of lawyers. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Louise. Now you've given us an extremely clear picture of what's happening in Colombia and the gap between what the Colombian government, those would like to be, us to believe and what the actual situation is. And it, it's still a very big gap. And you've also given us some extremely helpful pointers to what we, can, we, we in our different ways, different people taking part, lawyers, associations and others can do in a practical sense to contribute to an improvement 
in both Colombia and Guatemala. So thank you very much. Um, I think we're waiting for questions to come through. I don't know whether while we're waiting for the questions to be processed, see how many more come through, be useful to hear from Yvonne Guzman, if, if she's able to tell us something about the European Union dimension to this project. Yvonne, are you able to do that? Muchas gracias. Buenas noches y buenas tardes. Eh, bueno, básicamente es para contarles que este evento está siendo organizado en el marco del proyecto cofinanciado justamente por la Unión Europea, llamado Defendiendo la Tierra, el Territorio y el Medio Ambiente, promoviendo el trabajo de defensoras y defensores en América Latina. Eh, como ya han venido escuchando, es implementado por el consorcio integrado por Caldeache de Guatemala, el CINEP de Colombia y CAFO de Inglaterra y Gales, quienes desde el 2019 se han unido junto con el apoyo de AVI Colombia ante las similitudes y retos que enfrentan estos países latinoamericanos para construir paz en regiones donde no se han resuelto justamente las causas estructurales de los conflictos armados y donde es imperioso proteger a organizaciones, defensores de derechos humanos, especialmente pueblos indígenas, afrodescendientes y rurales. Esta acción busca, además de fortalecer sus capacidades, como está sucediendo en este evento, elevar las voces de sus luchas y resistencias, como es el caso de los riesgos que actualmente afronta la independencia judicial en ambos países. Entonces, creo que ya en el chat hay algunas preguntas y respuestas. Muchas gracias por habernos acompañado en este, en este evento y pues seguimos con la siguiente sección. Thanks very much. Um, well, then we do have a fair number of questions. I think we have one from Gerardo, based in El Salvador, working for the Guatemala as a program officer. Has the international community's pressure for protecting human rights reached a limit? Gerardo, do you want to ask your question? Gerardo? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm asking this because the civil society space in El Salvador and in Guatemala and many other societies is shrinking so fast that perhaps the struggle is naturally moving outside our boundaries because it's, uh, every time it's more difficult to hit the streets, to publish an opinion piece, because uh, you become an enemy of the regime and in our, our life, our security, our well-being is threatened. So uh, that's why I'm asking those questions, like how the global South can gather more international attention, how the international community can be more bold, bolder to take actions on these governments that are, that are attempting against a uh, human right defender lives. So Hector, can you perhaps try and answer the question? Sí, claro. Yo creo que la única manera en la cual efectivamente podamos eh, externar todas nuestras denuncias, todas nuestras preocupaciones de lo que está sucediendo a nivel general, porque no solamente es el nivel de justicia, este tema Ahorita es justicia, ¿verdad? La independencia judicial de Colombia y, y, y Guatemala. Y, y de hecho agradezco a, a las dos colegas que nos acompañan en el foro, tanto a Lisset eh, como a la jueza de la Corte Penal por sus recomendaciones. Y por favor, jueza, no es ningún fraude que usted esté hoy con, con nosotros y nosotras esta tarde noche. Y creo que es un privilegio para todos y todas escucharle a usted. Y, y pues para aterrizar un poco en la pregunta que hace el compañero Gerardo, pues efectivamente es la única vía que tenemos esta, estos conversatorios de denuncia, estos conversatorios donde solicitamos y pedimos que efectivamente esta barra de abogados, por ejemplo, haga una caravana similar a la que ha he hecho en Colombia, la haga en Guatemala, para visibilizar efectivamente lo que está sucediendo con la independencia judicial en Guatemala, con esa alta criminalización de los líderes y lideresas 
lo que está pasando incluso con la situación de la pandemia, que es otro tema que, pues, que no lo pudimos tocar por lo, el tema tan fundamental y profundo que es la independencia judicial en ambos países. Pero yo creo que esto, estos eventos es lo que hace que efectivamente la comunidad internacional eh, ponga sus ojos en, esto, en nuestros países. Y hablo de nuestros países, no solo Guatemala, Colombia, hablo también efectivamente de la región centroamericana, en el cual, pues en estos momentos, toda la región centroamericana estamos siendo atacados y atacadas por gobiernos que definitivamente, como el de Nicaragua, el mismo El Salvador, como el de Guatemala, y, eh, y ahora, pues ojalá, con una panacea que se tiene en Honduras, con un cambio, ojalá, de, 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 de algo que se cambie en Honduras también, esas estructuras, y que efectivamente pues, nos ayuden. Y es con esto, con estos conversatorios, con estos encuentros, con estos foros, que podemos denunciar lo que está pasando en nuestros países, y ojalá que la comunidad internacional, pues, eh, eh, tenga bien hacer estas misiones de verificación o estos pronunciamientos contundentes contra nuestros gobiernos de todo. Thank you, Hector. I have a, a similar question this time, I think, more for Julian from Sarah Chandler about what the international community could do in supporting the JEP in Colombia. Sarah, do you want to ask your question? Um, thank you, John. It's because um, we're active with the Colombia Caravana and we have um, done some trial observation, we would be able to um, consider doing trial observation, particularly if it is um, virtual. And I wonder um, whether that would be at all possible, but we are interested in any way that we can assist. Thank you. Julian. I have a comment on that. You're muted, so we, we can't hear you. Bueno, yo creo que... Ahí, ahí me escucha, ¿cierto? Sí. Eh, yo, yo creo que ahí hay como diferentes formas eh, que la comunidad internacional puede, puede apoyar. Eh, yo creo que la JEP actualmente eh, tiene en su conocimiento casos emblemáticos, como el que ya mencioné, el caso de, de Benito Osorio es uno de ellos. Eh, y, y, hay, y hay otros casos eh, que tienen una relevancia y una connotación muy importante para el país y, y para las víctimas. Eh, en el caso, por ejemplo, de, de Benito Osorio, pues eh, este, este testigo eh, ha sido amenazado eh, por eh, grupos criminales, eh, los cuales, pues, eh, eh, lo, han, pues, lo, lo, han, lo, han, lo han amenazado a través de, de diferentes comunicaciones eh, y yo creo que allí, eh, por ser, por ejemplo, este caso, eh, un caso emblemático, es fundamental que, que se pueda hacer quizás eh, un, un monitoreo y una verificación frente, frente a este caso. Eh, allí también hay algo muy importante, y es que en el marco de la pandemia muchas de las audiencias de la JEP eh, han sido virtuales o siguen siendo virtuales eh, y, muy, y muy seguramente bueno, si, si ustedes pueden hacer este seguimiento eh, virtual se puede eh, se puede acceder de forma virtual a las, a las, a las audiencias eh, y yo creo que eh, la comunidad internacional tiene un papel muy importante de, de seguir blindando a la JEP de, de, de seguir arropándola eh, y que, y, y que la gente pueda, pueda seguir con sus, con sus investigaciones, y no solo la comunidad internacional, yo creo que las organizaciones de la sociedad civil, inclusive las, las víctimas, tienen un rol muy importante eh, de contribuir a la legitimidad de este tribunal, como ya mencionaba, yo creo que la JEP no tiene una legitimidad per se, tiene una legitimidad que se va construyendo día a día, a, a medida que avanza con su, con su misionalidad, a medida que avanza con, con, con sus labores. Y, y si arropamos la independencia judicial de la JEP, pues muy seguramente vamos a lograr eh, develar esta verdad sobre el fenómeno del, del, para, del paramilitarismo y sus nexos y sus, y sus interacciones con, eh, con élites políticas y, y sectores económicos que todavía sigue siendo un vector de impunidad 
eh, en toda la sociedad colombiana, ¿no? Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. It's a, a, a good answer. There's a, a further question from Sue Wilman, Chair of the Human Rights Committee of the Law Society, to both speakers, I think. Um, Sue, do you want to ask your question? That's very much on the same lines as the earlier questions. Sue. Yes, thank you very much for this event, AB Colombia. I think it's been really useful, although Guatemala and Colombia have different histories, to try to draw some connections between the different Central um, and South America and Latin American countries. Um, I had the honor to meet um, Judge Erica Ifan in 2016 on a Law Society delegation. Uh, and so I addressed to Judge Corner, um, partly. Um, it's, it's very useful. The judges, I found, took a great deal of support from meeting with other judges. And so I wonder if there is support for a, a kind of Central American delegation to include uh, members of the judiciary to uh, return to Guatemala, Colombia, and possibly El Salvador, um, subject to the risks of, of, of travel at the moment. And if the uh, speakers we've heard from tonight um, think that that would be useful if we if that could be arranged uh, in the next 12 months. Thanks. Hector, do you want to reply to that? Sí, gracias. Eh, respondo eh, con los agradecimientos. Creo que producto de estos espacios es esto, lo que está mencionando eh, eh, ella en el sentido de poder hacer una misión con verificación con jueces de alto nivel que vengan a respaldar el trabajo que realizan sus, con, sus copartes, digámosle, sus similes, sus jueces, los jueces y juezas de Guatemala, Colombia, El Salvador, también Nicaragua, Que, ha, que hacen un trabajo realmente objetivo e imparcial, estos jueces independientes, que tristemente los tenemos que contar con los dedos de la mano, porque no son muchos ni muchas, pero que efectivamente los pocos que, que están ahorita eh, llevando estos tipos de casos de justicia en transición, también los casos del presente, como bien los mencionaba, como bien los mencionaba Lisset, de la Exisic, por ejemplo, son casos de, de alto impacto, son casos de alto riesgo que efectivamente necesitan el respaldo los jueces y las juezas que los llevan, porque es, son contraestructuras, contra esas estructuras añejas que se han instalado en nuestros países. Guatemala tiene un, unas estructuras que aún todavía se mantienen, y eso es lo que la CICIC en su momento tocó, esas estructuras oligarcas guatemaltecas, y pues claro, Eh, los oligarcas guatemaltecos, al verse vulnerados en esta situación, pues hicieron todo lo que pudieron hacer, todo el lobby correspondiente a efecto, la CICIC en Guatemala desapareciera tal y como desapareció. Y ahora queda una fecha que, como les contaba, pues tristemente la Fiscal General del Ministerio Público se, se está encargando directamente de diezmarla, quitando a, desde, su, desde su fiscal como Juan Francisco Sandoval, y ahora a los otros fiscales también de la misma FESI y auxiliares fiscales. Entonces es un desmantelamiento que ha habido y definitivamente, reitero, eh, y a, añoro que efectivamente se haga esa delegación de jueces de alto impacto y que vengan a respaldar a los jueces guatemaltecos. Good, thank you. Julian, do you have anything to add to that? Sí, quizás yo eh, en la misma línea de Héctor, yo creo que es, es, es muy importante que se pueda conformar una misión, una, una, una comisión que pueda eh, analizar las condiciones de independencia en el caso de Colombia eh, sobre la jurisdicción especial de paz. Por ejemplo, creo que la caravana de, de juristas ya ha hecho varios ejercicios Eh, de monitoreo y observación de juicios acá en Colombia, quizás esas lecciones aprendidas sobre esas observaciones puedan ser aplicadas eh, sobre estos casos emblemáticos que estoy comentando en la JEP 
quizás quisiera hacer una observación final y, y adicional, y es que esto no, no es solo inclusive la seguridad de los comparecientes, creo que Del, del debido proceso, por ejemplo, desde el acceso a la información que deben tener los abogados, especialmente, por ejemplo, con la, con la publicidad de las diligencias que también eh, está siendo vulnerado frente, frente, frente a algunos representantes de víctimas y que quizás eso también sea muy, muy, muy importante eh, empezar a analizar por parte pues, de, de, de una comisión que se pueda conformar y, y, y venir a analizar estos juicios. Y además creo que es muy importante que quizás estos juicios sean, sean observados porque muy seguramente pues, seguirán siendo eh, unos laboratorios, unas lecciones aprendidas para otros, para otros tribunales que muy seguramente se seguirán conformando a nivel mundial para analizar estos crímenes pues, que ocurren en, en los diferentes conflictos. Thank you very much, Julian. I think, um, I'm not aware of any further questions. We have a little bit of time left, so if, if anybody... Uh, can, sorry, uh, John, can I, can I just say, I think Lisette's got her hand up as well. Ah. Um, could, I, could I just say something on, on, on what's just been said? Um, the, the training we did was done um, via the Judicial College of England and Wales. Um, it was funded by the Foreign Office, um, prosperity fund then it's stability and something or other fund um, I can't remember the exact name I know um, that there are still people working in particular in the embassies in Panama Peru and I believe Colombia um, who um, are there to assist and I think there would be interest um, in, in doing what, what the, the judicial college would be interested in doing what it could to help out. So um, I, I think an application to the judicial college um, would, would, would probably reap um, some results. Right. Thank you very much. Is that? Thank you, John. Um, I think it is important for, for us to have a little bit of, of reflection on, on how we can support our uh, um, counterparts in Guatemala, well, in the wider Latin America, especially those who are operating under extreme circumstances um, and risk to their lives and those with their families. Um, in our experience, what, one of the things that has been very uh, effective in terms of uh, trying to prevent uh, creating or generating even more risks to their lives is bringing their profile to the international community. So I think Hector already mentioned and, and other, or others mentioned uh, the uh, continuous possibility of having this sort of webinar uh, attracting a, a wide range of, of audiences, uh, not only to raise awareness, but also to provide that the safety net that they need uh, most of the time. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, what we have found is that we need to break the isolation. Uh, some of our colleagues, including Gerardo, I think he mentioned Nicaragua. I think breaking isolation is paramount. Uh, and the CISIG experience, for example, uh, one of the lessons learned that he gave, he gave us is that is a good example of how multilateralism could be used to strengthen the rule of law and how actually bringing a mechanism uh, in order to support national efforts can be very effective in empowering not only civil society, but also the different justice operate, uh, operators within that particular country. Uh, in addition to that, uh, one of the interesting experiences that we collected through our research is that is that shortly after uh, a, a, so the, 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 the allegations of, of, of uh, illegal financing, campaign financing arose and um, lobbying groups were put together in order to target uh, uh, senators and congressmen in the United States in order to reduce uh, uh, the support uh, of the United States government towards the CSIC. 
I think it is important for the international community to be aware that equally to those efforts, similar efforts can be made in all in support of in those institutions uh, that uh, um, that are needed. Uh, I think the CISIC needed a, a great deal of support at a particular point in time. And unfortunately, I feel that we didn't put enough pressure on our different governments uh, in order to make sure that the CISIC continued. Uh, and this is obviously something that as part of the international community, we need to be very reflective of. And last but not least is, as I said during my intervention, is providing that support, uh, um, but without um, any particular agenda or interest. Uh, and I think that's also very important because um, civil society can get very suspicious on, to the, on the international community and on the reasons why we are providing that support. And I, need, I think we need to be reassuring that what we're doing is in order to support the rule of law and safeguard human rights for the people that are affected. Thank you. Well, th thank you very much, Lisette. I think one clear message is that international interest, support, and pressure does make an impact. At the same time, we're dealing with countries that have been used to this kind of pressure for quite some time and have developed ways of, uh, ways of trying to neutralize it. In the case of Colombia, I'm not, uh, not at all surprised that the Colombian government reached some kind of agreement with the International Criminal Court. I'd be more surprised if they actually stick to that agreement. And I think it's, it's important to make sure that if people do reach these, these sorts of agreement, they actually carry them out. In Guatemala, it seems to be a more brazen attack on the whole idea of, of, of judicial, judicial in, independence. But in either case, I think it's, it's been clear from today's discussion that more and more focused international support and pressure can only help. I don't know whether any of our speakers would like to um, make any concluding comments because I think we are pretty well out of questions unless anybody else has their hand up. Then maybe we could start just have a, 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 cup, a, a sort of two minute final comment from each of them. Hector, would you like to just say a few words from Guatemala? Sí, gracias, John. Eh, sí, únicamente agradecer el espacio, agradecer este momento. Creo que ha sido muy importante este webinar, este conversatorio respecto al tema de la justicia, a los riesgos, los ataques y amenazas que juezas y juezas independientes tienen. Creo que definitivamente, ojalá se pueda realizar esta esta caravana de abogados, abogadas, de jueces y juezas eh, a nivel eh, internacional que venga a hacer esta misión de verificación, de observación a cómo está el trabajo que se está realizando y cómo son los ataques que realmente están recibiendo los juezas y juezas. Tristemente, como les digo, no pudo acompañarme el juez Pablo Chitumón, eh, pero definitivamente también está en riesgo, ¿verdad?, su propia situación laboral incluso laboral, porque pues se imaginan ustedes de que eh, quien les ha retirado su, su inmunidad es la propia Corte Suprema de Justicia, es decir, pues eh, específicamente eh, la estructura que tiene que eh, ver que, que estas denuncias son espurias, eh, son infundadas, pues son los que dan ese aval. Así que de mi parte agradecer mucho el espacio, agradecer a, a Luis, eh, a ti, a todos los, los ponentes y participantes y los que han estado en este conversatorio, en este webinar, eh, para que, y, y que han tenido esa paciencia para escucharnos, para que efectivamente de, se den cuenta de lo que está sucediendo en un país ahorita actualmente como Guatemala en cuanto a su cooptación general del Estado y el tema de la independencia judicial. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Héctor. Julian, would you like to make a few final remarks? Sí, John, de, de antemano agradecer a, a todos y, y todas las participantes que estuvieron el día de hoy escuchándonos. Eh, Luis hizo pues, un contexto sobre la difícil situación que hay en Colombia, el escalamiento 
eh, del conflicto armado y las comunidades han quedado como en medio de este fuego cruzado entre diferentes actores que están, eh, que están luchando por el copamiento del espacio que fue dejado eh, por la desmovilización de las FARC. Eh, pero más allá de eso, mmm, yo quisiera insistir con, 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 con algo que dije en mi intervención, es el, el, un círculo virtuoso de la independencia judicial, el deber de investigar, juzgar y sancionar y la garantía de las víctimas a la verdad, justicia y reparación. Esto es fundamental en la transición que está haciendo Colombia eh, hacia la paz, si lo podemos llamar, pues que estamos en una transición hacia la paz en medio del conflicto, pero muy seguramente, pues, eh, mientras eh, la jurisdicción especial de paz pueda, pueda continuar con su labor, pueda eh, continuar abriendo nuevos macrocasos y continuar con su deber de investigar y sancionar, eh, muy seguramente las, las víctimas eh, van a continuar eh, cimentando la legitimidad sobre la JEP. Y allí finalmente pues insistiría de nuevo sobre la, la importancia de la presencia de la comunidad internacional, de su verificación, de, de, de que tengan sus ojos sobre la jurisdicción especial de paz eh, para, para que ésta pues, pueda tener eh, una, una sólida y fuerte independencia judicial y garantizar los derechos de las, de las víctimas. Y, y bueno, pues esperamos que esta, esta, esta comisión se pueda hacer realidad y, y poderlo recibir en Colombia, ¿no? Very good, thank you. Judge Joanna Corner, any final comments? I, I think tonight has shown that those of us um, living at Sutton in The Hague, at the International Criminal Court in the UK, Holland, wherever it is, um, who are judges, um, really don't appreciate just how lucky we are. Um, and it's something like this that, that wakes you up to the fact of, 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 of how rare it is in, 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 in so many different countries. And I do strongly feel, and I know that, that most of my fellow judges, certainly in the UK and certainly at the ICC, um, although we are more constrained by what we can or cannot say, obviously, in public, um, but for certainly judges in the UK, there is support for the judiciary in beleaguered um, nations where rule of law is so important. Uh, the Afghanistani judges who fled um, have received help and assistance um, in, in the UK. I imagine the same will happen with the Ukraine. And I know that I am speaking for, um, I'm not speaking as an ICC judge now, I'm speaking as an English judge, that um, my fellow judges will be happy to do anything they can to assist in, in Colombia and Guatemala. Thank you for that, very important statement. Thank you. Lisette. Thank you, John. Um, with regards to a few thoughts or reflections, um, it is important to, for, for us to understand that rule of law reform takes time. And as Guatemala has shown, it is not a straightforward path. The international community must continue taking advantage of the relative stability in Guatemala to continue engaging with the country and its civil society. This may require finding new and effective models of development cooperation to ensure more sustainable ways of strengthening the rule of law. I would also like to mention some recommendations to continue strengthening the rule of law in Guatemala, but that may be applicable to other jurisdictions. The first one, guaranteeing the independence of the judiciary requires not only that the Guatemala executive and legislature adheres to the separation of powers, but that judges are empowered to act independently with integrity and impartiality without fear of retaliation or personal attacks. Two, breaking isolation will require that Guatemala and the international community agree on new long-term cooperation efforts and investment to fight corruption, strengthen the rule of law and protect human rights. 
And the last is continuing efforts to fight corruption will require that Guatemala develops new and innovative mechanisms to eradicate corruption with support from and in cooperation with the international community. Without an effective and independent uh, justice system, the rule of law and human rights cannot be secured. Thank you. Louise. Thank you, John. Um, yes, I suppose a couple of things I'd like to highlight. One is that it is interesting, uh, the, one, the question, I think it was the first question that came up about getting an international reaction to the situations uh, in, in Central America and, and in Colombia. And I think that for those of us who are on this, uh, in this event who are from European uh, countries, really our governments take an interest in what's happening in those countries when civil society within these countries actually lobby the MPs and you yeah. talk to your MPs and the organizations do. And we've certainly seen that in Colombia. Colombia is on the, on the British agenda because of the amount of parliamentary questions that is being asked about Colombia and the level of interest of civil society organizations. And I think that this is, uh, so I make a, a particular call to those of you who are on this, this call from various different countries to write to your MPs about what's happening here and ask them to ask questions in their parliaments. AB Columbia will put up a letter on Friday, a standard letter that people can use if they want to, to write to their MPs about this situation in both Colombia and Guatemala. So that's the first point I want to, to make. The second is that we have um, an advantageous position right now in the UK, in the sense that the UK hold the pen on the UN mission of verification to Colombia. And so that means they take the, the, the lead uh, in the UN Security Council on this verification mission. So there is more responsibility, I think, placed right now on the UK um, to react to what's happening in Colombia. Not that we've seen that <laughs> very visibly yet, but you really need to put pressure on the, on the UK government to actually take some, to react in terms of what's happening in the UN Security Council with the situation in Colombia. And a really good piece of news was that the UN Mission of Verification's mandate was expanded to monitor the implementation of the sentences um, by the special jurisdiction of peace. So lawyers, groups and associations have a platform in which to feed into the British government, certainly, and also the Irish government who have a seat on the UN Security Council at the moment, in terms of saying um, there needs to be space for the uh, HEP to operate, it needs to have the budget to operate, and it needs to have um, an all uh, statements against it to undermine its work need to stop. Um, and I think that the UK therefore has a responsibility given its role on the UN Security Council. Um, and finally, uh, uh, when, well, two things finally. One is that we will have an event when the Truth Commission report is published. Um, it comes out in June, but our event will be in September. And um, I hope that people will join us for that call and we can look together at what we can do to ensure that this doesn't stay on the shelf, but we take action on it. And finally, I think it's really important to pay tribute to, as, as many of the other speakers have, the real courage of human rights defenders like Hector and Julian, who really put their lives on the line in the work that they're doing. And um, really, I can't say enough about how how much we we admire the works that you do and the fact that you risk so much in doing it. So thank you. Well, thank you, Louise. I, I would certainly, in my own experience, strongly endorse what you say about the need for and the impact of parliamentary interest. It's certainly the case, in my experience, going back 20 years, that Colombia wouldn't be on the agenda to the extent it is without that constant parliamentary interest which we can all help to keep going, which you and other organizations have helped to keep going, and we can all help to keep going. So I hope people, as many people as possible will take up your offer of a letter on Friday. So I think it's time to wind up this 
what for me has been an extremely informative and interesting um, event. I certainly know, have learned a great deal. I strongly echo Judge Corner's comment that we don't know how lucky we are here in this country. We have learned so much about the challenges, the difficulties, the risks and the dangers of being a human rights defender in the legal system in Guatemala and Colombia. We strongly salute the courage and the determination and the commitment which Hector and Julian have expressed, which so many people in these countries show. We hope we can do what we can with support, with presence, with the kind of accompaniment that people have talked about. And a big thank you to all the speakers and to AB Colombia for organizing the event. And I'd say make a, a special thanks as well to Georgina Turner and Theo Fox, who worked behind the scenes to make this event possible. And of course, our two indefatigable interpreters, James Lupton and Juliana Marine. So thank you very much.